And again, welcome. I'm gonna, there we go, there's Mike. He just opened his uh, webcam up. Um, we've been experiencing some audio issues today, so we're going to take it in turn speaking. Uh, I wanna go through a couple of housekeeping first things, and then we'll go through uh, who we are and why we're doing this event today. You can see there that our motto basically is water is water, not waste. If you are experiencing any bandwidth issues today, I'm looking at our monitor here and we seem to be good to go. But things you can do to improve your reception, turn off any software programs or email or anything that's using up your CPU power in the background. If you don't need them for the next hour, turn them off. Uh, if you are using a speakerphone, we would appreciate it if you would mute it um, when we get ready to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Obviously, you're invited to unmute it. If you're ex watching this in a public place, it is kind of nice for everyone else if you did use a USB headset. Um, obviously, if you can hear me speaking, you have audio, just problem, no problem at all. Um, there are going to be some flash videos that are shown during this presentation. Not all browsers and platforms can show this. I just shoot me an email after the event if the videos are not showing for you, and we will send you a link to them in our Dropbox folder. So, uh, as we go through this, you may be looking at this on a smartphone or on a handheld tablet, in which case your real estate is nowhere as big as the two whopping great 27-inch monitors that I'm using. So, any of the little separate window pods that you see there, uh, you can make those full screen. If you over the top right corner of any of them, I'm going to move this, you will see this little image appear. This is the full screen toggle switch. You click and it will make that particular image full screen. If you click again, it will bring it back to the uh, normal layout. Uh, the chat window, I see some of you have discovered that already. If you're not familiar with the chat window, type what you want to in the bottom bar and then either hit return or click on the uh, little symbol here the, uh, the ch the looks like a, a comment balloon. You can choose to talk with everyone, or you can choose to send your message directly only to the presenters. You'll see there's a little pull down block of text menu there at the top of the chat window. You can make, if the size isn't big enough for you, you can enlarge it for yourself. Um, you can also inactivate the sound so that you know, if you need that, that will help you. If you're watching this recording, obviously you won't be able to enter anything into that chat window, uh, but everything that's in there is live and copyable and downloadable if you're watching this uh, later as the recording. Uh, again, if you have any audio, you can go to the meeting pull-down menu and go through the audio setup. If you're really having some awful problems and you need some technical support, in the top right of the corner, you'll see the help menu. This takes you directly through to Adobe, who, if you need some issues with that, with, with them to work with them to get resolved, they're the best people. Uh, we will do our best to sort out minor issues, but obviously we don't want to interrupt Mike as he's going through his presentation. Uh, you'll also see at the top of the screen the little guy with his hand held up. And uh, if you click on that, that tells us that you want someone to pay attention to you, or perhaps you would like a microphone. And this is where I tell people, don't do it right now because we're just showing you how to do it. But you'll see, too, you have the option to use some emojis and some other things as well there. And applause and wada boys is always well done. Uh, this is my contact information. I'm Denra Best. And this will appear again at the end of the presentation. Um, one thing I do want to draw your attention to is that any time we do anything using the web, the capacity for things to go horribly wrong is, is pretty iffy, you know, you have a 50-50 chance of pulling it off and not having anything go really weird. So, uh, you'll see at the bottom here, this is our little image. 
and we very appropriately use the uh, image of the little dung beetle pushing his pile of uphill. So if you see this on the screen, bear with us because we will be trying to resolve that in the background. And I'm just going to uh, minimize this a little bit and move it out of the way so that if that should happen, then you'll know what that is about. Now, at this point, uh, we do have a couple of uh, things about who we are. We're a public out outreach and a consulting agency. Uh, we're dedicated to the advocacy that protection of water is a, water is a vital human and ecological asset. And what we seek to advocate that is through the implementation and management of affordable, appropriate wastewater systems. We're a national and an international education service provider, and we host and facilitate meetings just like this. Uh, we're independent, we're impartial, we assist individuals and communities, we help people find financial and the environmental advantages, and really what we're advocating for is the implementation of sustainable, integrated water infrastructure. Because as we said, quite simply, water is water, not waste. Uh, the disclaimer is, and this I have to read for our legal representative, uh, the presentations Wastewater Education 501c3 hosts and makes publicly available should not be construed as an endorsement or a paid advertisement. We do accept and encourage sponsorships and underwriting to enable these edu education events to be provided at no charge. Um, we do ask you please to visit our website. If you've never heard of us before, you'll find our most recent annual report and I will copy and put this into the chat window for you so you can watch it later. Um, we are committed to making our education events available to those who are hearing sight or other disability impaired and for those for whom English is not your primary language. And once these events are published to YouTube, you will see that they are all have closed captioning and translation that, uh, services are enabled. And at this point, Mike, I am going to shut down my video, move to the presenter area, and I am going to mute my microphone. <gasps> First thing I want to do is to thank Kate again. and Denner for all their, their okay. hard work in the background and, and making right. this, this whole presentation possible. Um, you know, uh, I think Dendra mentioned a couple times that she's a 501C and donations, tax deductible donations are what make these educational events possible. <clears throat> so uh, what are we here for today? We're here for, for to talk about INI. Um, INI is basically the... Uh, same thing in the in in the sense that it has the same end effect on a wastewater treatment system, but they are different technically. Um, I and I are both terms used to describe groundwater or stormwater that enters a sanitary wastewater or collection system uh, that's unwanted. We don't want it to go into the treatment plant. Both have the same effects. But technically, they're different. I, I I do know that I and I has been a buzzword for quite some time, but I, I want to go uh, I want to go over their technical differences. Inflow can be seen here on my drawing uh, in the blue. So inflow is stormwater that enters a sanitary system at points of direct connection to the system. You know, an example there is roof drains, footing drains. Uh, clean out caps that are unconnected or a storm connection. Some systems are combined. I know municipalities spend a lot of money separating them, but there's still some out there that are combined. Uh, today, if you try to build a home, you're not allowed to hook your roof drains and your footing drains into the sanitary system. But uh, technically, they're different. So the, the definition of infiltration is groundwater that enters the sanitary system through cracks and leaks and defects and that could be seen like the root system here or a faulty connection here or even just a crack right in the middle of the pipe another big spot that can enter is in the manhole at the, at the joints or in the chimney area or even right at the top of the manhole now I, I happen to be an expert on the manhole area and that's what we're going to be talking about today 
a lot. Now, I and I are both clear water in the sense that they don't need to be treated like sanitary waste. If it's, if it's running down the side of a street, it's not going to cause health problems and health issues. But it can have some contaminants in it, like uh, pesticides from your lawn or oil that's on the road and it catches, you know, that drips from your car and it catches and it goes in the stream. But it doesn't need to be treated the same as um, a sanitary waste. So that's why we kind of call it clear or clean water. Now, what causes I&I? There's many, many causes of I&I. I could do a, a whole, um, I could do a whole presentation on just the causes. But you know, some of the major causes are age-related deterioration, uh, loose joints, poor design, the roof drains going into the system. That's that's a poor design. Uh, maintenance errors. Uh, I'm sure you've all had system, you know, had somewhere in your system where the highway department decided to do some new paving, and they don't ma raise that manhole up to grade properly, and it leaves that little divot in the road there, and that divot collects water, pouring it into the into the sanitary system during rain events. Now, the average. Uh, um, Oh, and oh, another thing I want to add there is Mother Nature. She's probably the number one cause, and that's kind of why I put rain in on our picture here. She's probably the number one cause because when it rains, uh, things can go crazy. The other day when we were putting together the information for this webinar, uh, in Wisconsin, in nine, they had nine inches of rain in a 24-hour period, and the havoc that was wreaked on that system made national news. You know, that's why we all had heard about it. Mother Nature rains and makes the trees, you know, roots grow and, and grow grow root balls. I've seen root balls inside of manholes that were size of uh, bowling balls, and it's amazing the destruction that they did to the concrete structure as they were growing. Now, the average life expectancy of a sewer system is somewhere about 20, maybe 50 years. Uh, most of the systems that are out there have been in the ground longer than that. So if you have a system out there, I'm pretty sure you want to come up with a way to, you know, stop, you know, I and I or manage your con and, and control it. And, you know, that's what we're here to talk about today. And we're going to concentrate a little bit later um, on some budget friendly ways to control it. Now, um, we've all heard the saying, uh, dilution is the solution to pollution. Um, well, that may be the way they did things in the past, and that's what was the whole idea behind combined systems. But today, dilution actually causes more of a problem, and, it's, and it can actually be considered pollution. Wastewater treatment plants are built today with limited capacity. They have a defined volume. They're given permits to uh, treat 100,000 gallons a day or X amount of gallons per month. So it's very defined. So every time you get the inflow and the infiltration, it can wreak havoc on those numbers. This, this little slide here that I just put up about uh, one leaking manhole, the first time I heard this, it, it blew my mind. And, and, and when I'm going to go through some numbers for you. If you think of one manhole in your system that leaks 10 gallons a minute, over 60 minutes, that's 600 gallons. Over a 24-hour period, you're talking 14,000 plus gallons. If if a sewer treatment uh, plant is paying somewhere around a dollar 75 to two dollars per thousand gallons to treat that water as it's coming through, you're talking about spending somewhere around nine thousand dollars per year to treat water that was clear, clear, didn't need to be treated. As a matter of fact, recently in uh, Milwaukee, they spent uh, $3 billion doing a detention for, for inflow and infiltration, you know, for their storm drains. And I think one of the tunnels cost somewhere around uh, $162 million. So you can see there's big numbers in controlling this and good reasons to. The next slide I have up here is uh, a little Excel spreadsheet that Parson Environmental developed over the years. And it's a really neat uh, item. It can be used to, uh, we can customize it so you can use it in your system. Um, and if anybody wants to stick around after the question and answer session, we can actually show you how that's done. Um, Kate just put a poll up, as you can see, if you could participate in that. But I'm going to use the example that's up here. If you have a system that has 2,000 
uh, manholes in it and only 36 percent of them get affected during a rain event you got 720 manholes that are affected well i talked a little bit earlier about being a manhole expert we have a, a product called the parson manhole insert which i'll show you in a couple seconds here um cost about 38 dollars when you're buying you know 700 plus of them and this this spreadsheet calculates a savings which which includes this 38 dollars the cost of the insert over the first year you can save somewhere about $125,000 if only 36% of your manholes are affected. Imagine if all of them are being affected, the savings. Over a five-year period, you can save three-quarters of a million dollars. I'll bet everybody could come up with something they could use three-quarters of a million dollars for in their, uh, <laughs> in their system, that's for sure. <clears throat> Now, I think Kate's going to cut and paste over here in your chat box uh, into there a downloadable link so you can download this and have it on your desktop. So once we do show you how to use it, you know how to customize it for your system. To uh, put an example from the poll, we'll see. Okay, the next uh, reasons for wanting to control INI are additional connections. I just talked about earlier that uh, manhole uh, that sewer treatment plants have a limited capacity. In other words, they have a certain amount of gallons per day they can they can they can process legally under their permit and discharge into the stream. If you can control uh, a, a rain event that has 250,000 gallons going into your system, and you can control that and limit it to you know a couple thousand gallons. And if you think that the set aside for an average house is somewhere around 3,000 gallons per day, and you controlled or eliminated 250,000 gallons coming in, you can hook an additional 80 plus homes into that system without any additional treatment capacity. Now that's great because we all know what it costs <laughs> to build a new you know, sewer treatment plant, millions and millions. Another reason to want to control and manage this is overflow and unwanted discharge, untreated discharge. Nothing worse than you hear about in your local town uh, that the, the local sewer treatment plant discharge into the stream you like to fish into. <laughs> that's that's the worst. And, and, and I even saw something this weekend that at Niagara Falls, they were doing some routine maintenance and uh, they did some discharge. It was actually a planned discharge, but they didn't know that it was so volatile at the bottom of the clarifier they were cleaning that it made a big black oil slick and it you know looked like oil, but it was sludge and it made a, uh, a really, made national news and a real public nightmare for that treatment plant and you know we don't know how that's going to end up uh, well, another public nightmare I can think of is backflow and I bet everybody's had that and you know just to explain what backflow is I'm sure we all know but it's when when the system gets so inundated with water and someone goes to use the facilities in their home it, it, it won't go into the system because it's completely filled or it's so filled that it flows back into the home and, and everybody's basement gets flooded. There's nothing worse when the mayor gets a phone call and, you know, the trunk over here, everybody on that street, uh, their basements are flooded. And we all know that homeowner insurance usually doesn't cover that kind of stuff. So it's going to be up to the town to uh, <laughs> to cover those things or, you know, get lawsuits or whatever. And that's what we're trying to avoid by managing and controlling the I&I. &I. And earlier I talked about uh, dilution being a solution to pollution. But it, it, the way that sewer treatment plants work today is too much dilution will affect the biological and chemical treatment of the process. So if it's diluted too much, the, the, the clarifiers and the digester mechanics are not going to perform as specified. You know, dilution can be an aspect of the treatment, but part of your operating permit is usually it requires testing that discharge into the local waterway that you're discharging it. And if that, that discharge is too volatile or it has too much of uh, the sewerage in it, you know, you can lead to further compliance, more regulation, or even fines. And nobody has in their budget money for fines, that's for sure. You know, we're scraping right now as it is in our local municipality to, to, to even treat what we have coming through.
You know, the reality of it is I and I will never, ever be stopped. If that were the case, that would be wonderful, but it will never be stopped because it's, it's, ever, it's, it's just ever-changing. No one knows when it's going to rain. Uh, no one knows where a tree root's going to infiltrate a pipe or a manhole. So it can never be completely stopped, but we can come up with ways to manage it and control it. And that's exactly what we're here for today. We're going to talk about managing it and controlling it. I put this little visual up here that I'll talk about in a minute. But there's some expensive ways and, and some not expensive ways to do that. And a couple of more expensive ways are things like smoke tests. If you think of uh, smoke testing a sanitary system, what they do is they inundate the sanitary system with smoke. And then they look for points of leaking. A good example of that is if you inundate that system with uh, a lot of smoke and you see three or four people on the street, there gutters are starting to smoke you could be certain that you need to get those gutters out of the you know that rain gutter out of the sanitary system because that's uh, inflow that you don't need another way is engineering studies and flow studies you know they can be very expensive uh, you know video cameras inspections things like that now I'm not saying don't do those things because they are necessary to identify problem areas um, but when you do when you do do those kind of studies it basically identifies it it doesn't really stop it so those are you know expensive ways to to, to identify it where I want to go to today um, is actually I, I kind of skipped over something here um, Regardless of whether you're doing those engineering studies or not, a community outreach program is, is, is a great way to uh, reach out to the community and have, have the citizens help us uh, you know, locate problems. And later, Dender and I were talking, we were, you know, we're going to do a series of these educational events, and we were hoping that um, we could put together a public, uh, a public education outreach program uh, webinar that will talk about, you know, if you don't already have one, ways that you can do this. And, you know, uh, another good way is, and I'm going to talk about this right now, is visual. This is probably the number one cost-effective way to see where you got problems. Now, anybody looking at this picture right here can tell you got a major problem. This whole puddle is about ready to go into these pick holes here and or seep around the manhole and get into that sanitary system, and it doesn't need to be. So visually inspection you know, is a great way to do it. It can be done in-house with your guys. And if you think about during a rain event, um, and that's the best time to do any of these inspections is during a rain event or right after it. But if you think about your crews, you got them out there working and maybe they're pouring a sidewalk or something, but you can't, you can't pour a sidewalk when it's raining, so you pull the guys into the shop and what do you got them doing? You have them working on a truck and, uh, you know, or you know, cleaning something up in the shop. Well, maybe throw a couple of these guys in a, in a truck and have them drive around and visually look for some of these, you know, uh, problems. And today, everybody has a smartphone. At least most everybody does. And if you think about when you snap a picture, you know, it's a G, usually most pictures today have a GPS tag on the photo, and you can take that picture, text it back to your foreman, and and tell them the problem. You know, let's say you found a broken flange. You take a picture of the broken flange, you know, put the street address of where it is, and text it back. Or obviously a sunken manhole like you're seeing right here. You know, if you see something like this, go ahead, take a picture of it, and text it back and plot it on your system so you know the next time you know when it's dry out you can go and, and, and do something about this manhole that it's gonna you know be inundated with rain okay what we got here is a very active leak right here you can see it and later in the in the presentation a few minutes here we're gonna show you how we actually stop that active leak now here we got a much smaller active leak it was right along this crack and we have a hydraulic cement that we're going to show you how we actually stop this leak uh, in a few seconds also. But just to review it again, you can see right here, very, very active leak. That's somewhere about 35 to 40 gallons a minute, and we're going to inject it with a chemical grout and stop that leak. And same thing right here. This is a, a dribbler, probably maybe a gallon a minute, much slower leak, but we're actually, during the repair, we're going to chase the leak right down that crack. And uh, in about 15 minutes later, it'll be completely stopped. Now, what causes this? Everybody knows it's ground shifting, soil changes, groundwater going up and down. Remember the picture, this picture here? Parsons came up with a solution to this right here. And it's called the manhole insert. 
Now, I think the manhole inserts are the best bang for the buck. Obviously, redirecting drain spouts and uh, you know relining pipes it can get expensive because you know relining a pipe or digging a pipe up, you got to dig the yard up. You have to um, you have to replace the lawn. If you've dug up some nice bushes, you know the homeowner is going to want to see new new bushes. But we came up with a really good thing, and it's this manhole insert right here. And what this manhole insert is, I think it's the best bang for the buck. I've heard somewhere, some numbers as high as 40% of rain event inflow comes from the top of a manhole. So remember that, that manhole that was puddling? If you put that insert into that manhole like that, you could, you could bring it down to about five gallons over a 24-hour period of drip down. And ra rather than it all going into there at once, now you have some time for it to either run somewhere else or possibly evaporate off. Now we make many different styles of, of the of the inserts. The one you're seeing there is an HDP, just the basic insert, HDPE, excuse me. Uh, that's just the basic insert. Some of them have valves for gas relief and pressure relief, and uh, other of them, uh, others are made out of stainless steel for heavy duty. Um, we can make it in just about any style. We have many, many styles and can fit most frames and covers. Okay, we're going to pull in a video now that shows you how easy they are actually to install. In the video here, starting to play, and you can see John has already cleaned the frame and the cover, already did a good wire brushing on them. Now he just takes that insert, pushes it in the hole, snaps it in place, makes sure it's fit good, and flip the cover back on. It's truly that simple to install them. We'll let you watch that once more. Again, like I said, he cleaned that frame and cover real good. Push it in, flip the lid on. Doesn't get much easier than that. All right, the next section I want to talk about sealing up is the chimney. Um, as we all know, our manholes usually four foot round on the bottom and they need to reduce it because it would be impractical to have a four foot cover over top of every manhole. So they usually reduce it to somewhere around 24, 26 inches and this is a an open manhole. So you can see here there's a, a real issue in the chimney area where it needs to be repaired and this can be repaired using RPM. It's a hydraulic cement, you mix it with potable water and you just trowel it on here and uh, it, it, it hydraulically stops the water from coming from the back side. Now an issue here would be when you're troweling it, you can't really trowel up onto the rim in the frame right here. Because what happens is cement being rigid, it would crack along this hole here. So the way we kind of solve that is with the, with the flex rib seal. Now what a flex rib seal is, one of the ways we solve it is right here. Now the flex rib seal is installed in the manhole. It's a high high density rubber and it's expanded using these metal rings and the outward pressure stops the water from infiltrating from the backside. You can see here's an installed one and you can see there it is installed right there. Now a flex rib seal if you were to have to cut out this whole manhole you know cut it all out and put a new frame and cover in there watertight be somewhere between three to five thousand dollars. You can put in a flex rib seal that completely completely stops that water right up under the fr frame right here and it stops any of that water coming in here on that chimney area for three four hundred dollars so you can see there's a real savings now to even uh, to talk about other budget friendly ways the next one I want to talk about is is FP oh there's a split picture I forgot to tell you about this that's that's the before and after the same manhole that's what it looked like before repaired the backside here with a little bit of RPM so it's sealed good and then that's it installed like I said, the next one I want to talk about is FP, and here's another one of the manhole frames. You can see this one is already pretty much patched up, but again, a real problem would be between this riser ring here, you can see there's that white area is a riser ring, and then onto the new frame and cover. If you tried to bring the cement up onto that, it would definitely crack because it's so rigid. So what we've come up with here is Parson Poxy FP, and that's FP installed. It's a two-part, high-strength, hybrid product epoxy that's applied to the underside of the frame and then onto the 
to the monolithic manhole and you can see that flex that that coating stays flexible so over time as as the manhole heaves due to weather or traffic happens to it this part right here won't crack and it solves that I and I because as it rains we already put the insert in to stop water coming in this part if you remember but all around this crack here and any crack in the roadway it seeps in there and it, and it comes from the back side this prevents that the next picture I show you is a split picture of the same product so wonderful product you can give us a call now this can be done for under two hundred dollars a manhole give us a call we can give you tips and techniques on how to use it okay remember earlier that video we showed you with the with the low volume leak and I promised you we're gonna show you how to stop it we have a video here we're gonna play it and you're gonna see that actual leak getting stopped see here's the leak that's it being active and we're going to stop it with Parson QP. It's a fast setting hydraulic cement that stops small active leaks. You can see what he's doing here is he's mixing it with potable water. And you got to work really fast with QP because it sets up in about 60 to, to 90 seconds. It's hard. But he's making a putty like consistency ball. And he's handing it to the guy that's in the manhole. And then he goes down. And he jams it right into the spot where it's most actively leaking. And what he'll do is he'll end up chasing it all around and stopping it. Now this gives me, uh, you can see he's in this manhole. Of course, it's about a two-foot deep manhole. So, uh, you know, he can stand up and be out of it. But safety first. Always use your personal protection equipment and do all confined space entry by the book. And you can see after about 15 minutes of working this around, he got it to completely stop watch it once more and again this is real time they had to work very fast to do this because that that QP will set up fast set up right in his hand but he's pushing it in there now and it stops the active leak another trick you can even see it over here when you look at the finished product you can see even right like here what they did is they took a, a handful of powder and held it against the wall there and the water seeping out reacted with the powder stopping that active leak a lot of little tricks like that we can show you when you give us a call on how to how to use the products. Now, also um, remember earlier we showed you uh, um, the the fast the fast leak. We're going to look at a garden hose. We have a product here, and it's called Parsons Seal Tight. And what Parsons Seal Tight is is it's a chemical grout and it's injectable. And the liquid in these two tubes here expands to at least 10 times its original volume, expanding, filling this five gallon pail up, as you can see. It's easily installed with just one of these dual guns, and it's uh, very economical to do in house. And what it does is it hardens to a rigid mass, and that rigid mass, before it hardens into that rigid mass, it's in the viscous form, and it travels throughout all the cracks and leaks and voids in the in behind the manhole and inside the manhole cracks fills it then it hardens to that rigid mass stopping the leaks okay, I'm going to do a little live demo for you right now I'm going to take my camera and I'm going to put it on my desk and again don't forget about safety when you're entering manholes you could you could see those guys uh, um, in the first one didn't have their gloves and stuff but in the next video I'm about to show you you're going to see that but first I want to do a little a little demo on my desktop you can see right here that's a, a 20 ounce cup and this is a, a little 50 mil and what I do is I'm going to squeeze it and it's going to go through that static mixer mixing it together <clears throat> watch what it does starts expanding and if you were feeling this you'd see the heat but look at that it's still expanding still going and at it now what it does when it's all done I did this one yesterday you can see right to a rigid mass I mean that's that that's hard so I'm gonna switch back up here so you can see me okay again remember I promised you that we would stop this high volume leak here 
That's what we're going to do. We're going to show you a video now. What he's doing is he's taking that gun in the static mixer. A little trick is he's putting the rag around the end to help, help keep it in there. Then he's pushing that gun as fast as he can. Fast as he can, he's squeezing that, getting it, emptying it out, both tubes, as fast as possible. And thank God for the time-lapse photography, because about two to three minutes later, because in its viscous form, like I said, it's going to travel in there into the cracks and all the voids and film, then it hardens up into that rigid mass, and that's when it stops the act of leaks. Now, through time-lapse, you can see, he breaks that end off, and look at that, the leak is completely stopped. And that was about a 35 to 40 gallon minute leak. And again, remember, you can see this guy's all in his personal protection gear, and he's all hooked up to the harness, uh, you know, confined space entry. Safety first, always safety first. And again, if you have some issues with any of these type of, of you know, stopping active leaks, we can always give you the tricks. Like, we, you know, we taught him to use that rag on the end there. And what it does is it kind of helps it hold the seal tight behind the structure while it's in its viscous form and expanding and going into the cracks. And you'll see over in the window, uh, the chat window right now, I got a question. It says, uh, asking if it's if they last. Yeah, yeah, we've had some repairs that have gone on for six to eight plus years. Um, and they're still stopping active leaks. I see another question that says if it's safe. Yeah, these are all made with uh, with uh, no solvents, H HFCs. Uh, you know, it's definitely environmental friendly. We've made it, you know, knowing that we're injecting it into the ground. And, you know, chemical grouts are used all across the industry. So, yes, it is safe environmentally. Okay, over here in the uh, chat window, we're also going to cut and paste some information. Um, one of them is a YouTube video on how to... Uh, you know our whole complete product line and another one is how, just a link to our website which kind of describes the product line and I think that pretty much you know wraps up what I want to do today other than the question and answer section so back to Dendra thanks Mike um, there was a question in here um, that someone texted to me uh, uh, can these products be used to repair on-site systems Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I've got a couple of septic uh, pump, pumpers, as we like to call them in the industry, that have repaired uh, uh, pick holes in tanks. And I've even had a, a big, huge 2,000-gallon tank where the seam, like you're seeing here, was faulted, where the original bitumus was faulting. And he basically injected this into that the key of that seam, and it flowed all the way around it and expanded and stopped the leak. So, yeah, it can be used in... In septic systems, septic tanks also. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions there. Seen a couple of thank you so muches. They've, I think we've hit most of the um, most of the things here. Uh, let's move on to the collaboration, the closing window here. Okay, um, what we're going to do right now is we are going to give a quick uh, couple of videos here. Um, you will see there's Mike's information, contact information, and mine. There are also a couple of web links in here. And if you're watching this on the YouTube video, we will go ahead and post those links in the comment window. Um, we want to draw your attention to the top one. This is the AWWA drip calculator because we've talked a lot about um, one particular aspect of water resource management today. But equally, when we looked at some of the causes of INI, uh, this obviously includes uh, w willful wasting of water from outside dripping faucets um, and just even inside, if you are treating, paying to treat clean drinking water, then you're in a, um, a world of hurt here. And when we looked at some of the slides Mike had about how that volume of water stacks up, that's quite something. And I wanted to show you a quick little video here. And I'm just going to make this bigger and uh, bring it over the top here. I want you to watch this video. And you will see that it is runs for 51 seconds. Just 
Just look how quickly that takes to uh, and you can see we put some food dye in there so that it shows up really well. And 51 seconds isn't that long. That's filling an 8 ounce cup, an 8 ounce measuring cup. And in the time it took you to watch this 51 seconds, over the course of the day, that would have wasted almost 106 gallons of water. Water that you've paid to treat, paid to transport, paid to pump, uh, paid to go into the drinking water system, and it's now going right onto the ground. And if there was a manhole cover or a storm drain next to it, that would have gone straight down into the treatment collection and treatment system. Over the course of a month, and we'll call this 30 days, that equates to a waste of almost 3,200 gallons of drinking water. Over the course of a year, that translates into almost 39,000 gallons of water. And uh, let's uh, just put this one away here a minute, because there's another one that I wanted to show you. Let me just a second here. This is this one. Oops, sorry, not that one. A drip can add up, isn't it? Amazing. Yes, just amazing. Okay, I want you to keep an eye on this particular spectacular video of I and I. This is on the freeway that goes around uh, Minneapolis. You can see from the date the travel the webcam caught this on July the third, nineteen ninety nine. Now that is what I call a storm surge. And when the water goes down, uh, take a look at what it reveals about the car that has stopped there in the middle of the screen. And the lightning, of course. And the reason it stopped is it hit the concrete cover of that storm drain. And while we, while we continue to watch this, and I think I have the YouTube video of the, the link for that. If I don't, I will uh, put it into the I'll put it into the YouTube recording. It happened again two or three times. In subsequent years, they did replace the solid cover with a grated one. But still, uh, what happens, as Mike said, is that we can manage it, we can plan for it, but we will never be able to control Mother Nature. And when you have this much water coming down into your systems, um, it has to go somewhere. And if there is a water surge, if there is an airlock in the system, it will find a way out. And if there's one message that we want you to take away from this session today, is that all water is connected. Um, we don't have water conveniently split up into drinking water, storm water, wastewater, water treatment, water dispersal, water reuse. Um, there really is only one source of water. Um, Mike, do you have any final comments that you'd like to say before we, we check out? Everything's for the day? grand. I think uh, other than thanking you for all your hard work and efforts to make this a success, thank you very much. And just to remind everyone that um, we're more than happy to stick around for a little while after this event and do a live demonstration of the uh, the manhole collection, the spreadsheet that we put a link in that window for. Absolutely. The uh, comments. In, Absolutely. Yeah, the comments in the comments in the Q&A there, we will, obviously if you're watching this on YouTube, you won't be able to negotiate these, but we will certainly copy and paste them into there. Um, keep an eye on our uh, newsletter. Uh, if you have not 
subscribe to it. We will make sure that you get that link. Um, also, just to let you know that coming up in the future, there will be other presentations about managing stormwater and infiltration. And uh, as Mike mentioned, we are happy to put together a how to do effective public outreach. Uh, the public are your amazing unpaid and often, of course, they're quite happy to give you a call and tell you exactly where things are not going particularly well. But on the other hand, when you can solicit their help to help you do them right, then um, that makes everybody's life so much less expensive and happier. So thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now, everybody. Bye-bye.